everyone, and welcome to Untamed Unfiltered. I'm Amanda Nicholson. And I am Aaron Provencio. And today we are joined by two very special guests, and that's Dr. Sarah Sirica and Dr. Camille Hopkins. How's it going today, you two? Doing wonderful. I'm doing great. Well, surely everyone knows by now what Untamed Unfiltered is all about, so I won't get into that, but tonight we are digging deeper into the world of wildlife diseases. That's right, and the topic of wildlife diseases is very interesting, but before we get into all of that, Dr. Camille, Dr. Sarah, I know we already kind of introduced you, but would the two of you mind going through and just telling us a little bit more about what it is that you do? Sure. Um... Hi, this is Camille Hopkins. I'm a wildlife veterinarian and disease ecologist. I serve as the wildlife disease coordinator for the US Geological Survey's ecosystem mission area based just outside of DC. And I oversee our portfolio of aquatic and terrestrial wildlife disease research across the nation. Um, hi, I'm Dr. Sarah Serica. I'm a one-year veterinary intern with the Wildlife Center of Virginia. So I do clinical practice here at the Wildlife Center, taking care of all of our native Virginia wildlife. Um, and we also consult with various veterinarians and groups across the country. Awesome. Well, thank you guys both for joining us uh, for this Untamed Unfiltered. Um, you both were in this episode of Untamed as well. So we just got to hear from you, kind of set the stage for us about emerging wildlife diseases, what, you know, what the whole deal is. Um, so I don't think we have to weed too deeply into the hows and what's of that world. Um, I'm more interested to dig more deeply with you guys uh, from your from your personal experiences and, and preferences and ideas and everything. Um, I think one thing that I really enjoy from working in this field is getting to know so many different people who work in wildlife rehabilitation and education and medicine. And it seems like everyone has this area where they just totally geek out and I love it. I love watching people geek out about topics that they really love and are passionate about. And I know that both of, of you have a particular interest in one health and diseases and um, and in this field. So, so really, I think I'm just interested to know why? <laughs> why the subject of diseases? I know, you know, Sarah, you and I have joked about like, oh, like, oh, yes, I love diseases. Um, <laughs> why, why are you both so interested in them? What's fascinating to you? So for me, uh, since I've been a child uh, reading National Geographic, I've been fascinated by the biodiversity of our planet. And to me, microbes are part of that biodiversity. So viruses, fungi, bacteria, parasites, prions. And um, in my PhD work, I focus on viruses. And to me, they're really fascinating, especially the RNA viruses because of the way they mutate and, and recombine and evolve. And so that's just really interesting to me. Um, and wildlife disease to me is also exciting, not just for the microbes, but because um, it's the complexity of looking at the ecosystem, uh, the wildlife populations, um, different trophic levels, and how disease outbreaks can impact um, not only a species, but potentially um, a community um, within the ecosystem. And then um, the last thing, uh, being in the, in the federal government, it is interesting to see the interplay between wildlife diseases and diseases um, that affect domesticated animals or diseases that affect humans. So having this one health approach to things, recognizing that there are diseases circulating in wildlife, you know, at the most basic level, right, rabies, um, that could impact domesticated animals or people, and then getting to work with individuals from who care about public health, who care about domesticated animals and thinking together, how can we respond to, how can we manage these different diseases? Yes, everything she said. <laughs> um, and then um, I feel like I come 
to it from a place of, you know, I was just really a huge science nerd, like from biology onwards, I just was hooked. Um, and so uh, anything where we can learn more about the natural world uh, just is fascinating to me. Um, I've been getting like very into lots of different things lately and, um, you know, like entomology and then like all the disease ecology things, all that it, there's so much interplay with everything. And then learning about how things affect the, you know, larger animal that we're used to working with, like bear size or bird size or something. And then going into what is affecting their mites and then what is affecting, you know, the bugs that are on the tree that they're eating from. And then like all the little things that parasitize and are living in and on them, all the microflora, like, it's just all fascinating. Um, and then um, I, it's also really interesting because it's something that's always changing. Like animals are evolving, but it seems like it's such a slow thing that happens over time versus diseases can change like minute to minute. Um, and as they cross over geographical areas, you know, over time, all of that's changing. So it's always something fascinating. Um, and then I also feel like it's really interesting because it has such a huge play in conservation, which is really important to me. Um, and we need to understand how different things affect these animals, um, not just like habitat degradation, but also uh, the diseases that are causing harm and you know whether or not we should intervene, which is always a huge question. Um, so all of that's just fascinating. And I feel like humans can make a positive impact too, not just, you know, spreading impact. I think it's so interesting to hear both of you speak about, you know, this kind of like, this like layered look that you kind of have to take when it comes to wildlife and ecosystems. I'm, I'm a big, I think I talk about systems thinking in almost every single one of these episodes we've, fil we've filmed. And I just, I love looking at like ecological processes from the biggest megafauna all the way down to the smallest microfauna. And I think there's this, you know, idea, and especially after the, the last year that we've had that diseases, fungi, bacteria, viruses, whatever it is, are always the bad guys. And they're always having negative effects on wildlife or people or this and that. But I'm wondering if the two of you would be able to contextualize the role of diseases and sort of pathology in, I guess, let's just say an ecosystem. What is the importance of these being around in the first place? So a couple of thoughts on that. Um, as I sort of mentioned, our biodiversity includes microbes. And I think um, there's a distinction between pathogens or parasites that are what we call endemic or native um, to an ecosystem versus those that are invasive and novel um, that wildlife have never encountered before. So I do think there are um, important relationships between microbes and wildlife um, at the individual level. You can think about parasites in the GI tract uh, that we would, that are normally going to be present. There are certain um, insects, uh, um, ticks that wildlife normally live with. Um, it's only when disease gets to a point, and we don't always, we can't always define it, some tipping point for that individual or for that population, that it will lead to such a significant outbreak of disease that we as humans need to think about intervening. Um, so for example, every year, uh, thousands of birds die uh, in the United States from avian cholera or avian botulism outbreaks. Uh, that is something that they are dealing with, that those populations deal with every year. Um, aspergillosis outbreaks, things like that. Uh, but then you have diseases like white nose syndrome in bats, which is an invasive pathogen uh, we believe came from Europe and our bats had never seen that before and so we've already lost millions of bats. Um, in fact, unfortunately, some of the declines were so significant that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed some of those species as, as threatened uh, because of the effects of white nose syndrome. So that's an example of a case where we need to intervene 
versus uh, some of the um, the other parasites and diseases that play a regulatory role, just like there's predator prey relationships, there are parasite relationships with wildlife that have uh, a regulatory role on those populations. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was beautiful. Um, so, and I feel like just to sort of continue on with that thought, um, the way I think of it, um, not a disease ecologist yet, um, is, you know, we know about like our internal biome and external biome. We know that there is bacteria and yeast and things that live on and in our body. Um, and then if we extrapolate that, you know, a lot of that is good. A lot of that even helps our immune system. Um, but once we get to, you know, something that invades where it shouldn't be, um, or if we're up against something that's going to cause more harm um, and not just be sort of like a um, population balancer kind of thing, um, that's something we have to worry about because there's you know, the, the things that are just circulating once the population size gets too large and then there's density changes. And then we have like, you know, circle of life things that happen um, that are gonna help balance that population um, versus, um, you know, just things that have been going along and along and, and they're healthy and, and part of the world. So when I was putting together the treatment for this episode, we knew we wanted to do one about emerging wildlife diseases. Um, I certainly am not remotely close to a disease ecologist. I just, you know, know minimal amount of things about some subjects. Uh, so I was like, okay, I gotta really, I gotta study up here. I gotta go hard on learning more about <laughs> wildlife disease. Um, and I ended up going down this rabbit hole and found this uh, USGS document actually about uh, why bother about wildlife disease. And it was really long and it was really interesting. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a lot here. This is great. Um, so that, so shout out to USGS for helping me put together this episode. Um, but I perked up when I was reading it because there were big chunks of it in there about um, Aldo Leopold. And, and that made me perk up because we've read uh, one of his uh, books for our wildlife book club that we have. But it was this idea of taking this really broad perspective of wildlife disease and some ideas that the ecological disruptions from human actions are the primary drivers here for wildlife disease outbreaks in, in some cases. And maybe this kind of fits in with what you were just saying as well. Um, and he's famously quoted in, in a lot of his publications as saying, uh, wildlife disease control is a matter of doctoring the environment, not the animal. So. Um, just wondering if you guys have perspective on that, if in all of your education, uh, when you're learning more about wildlife disease and have studied this subject so much, um, have you, you know, has that come up? Has Aldo Leopold come up? Have you read his books too? Yes, uh, love Aldo Leopold. Um, and a quick shout out to Milton Friend, who wrote the publication you're talking about from USGS. He used to be the center director for our National Wildlife Health Center. Um, he's now an emeritus. And um, yes, I think there, that quote from Aldo Leopold, Leopold is still relevant today, um, but there are some nuances there. So um, management of the, of the environment uh, versus the animal, uh, again, thinking back to um, some avian diseases that we see in waterfowl, for managers for, let's say, a, a wildlife refuge or um, a state, uh, state lands where they might see some of these significant disease outbreaks, there are opportunities to, for example, manage water. And management of water resources can then um, help to maybe decrease the impact or the, um, the amount of animals that might die from some of those waterfowl diseases. Uh, however, there are some instances where uh, managing the environment, well, it might, it, it would help, but it's not always the only way to approach wildlife disease management. Um, so, Managing the environment can include managing invasive species that uh, might be a problem, like in Hawaii with avian malaria, in forest birds, 
uh, managers there are looking at how can they, uh, in a natural setting, which is, is very different, think about managing the invasive mosquito vectors that carry an invasive parasite that has been impacting those native birds. Um, they can also think about, though, are there ways to um, manage things in the habitat to decrease other stressors on those susceptible wildlife so they have a better chance to be resilient or, or adapt to disease? Because de disease is often one of many stressors on wildlife. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is when it's not always uh, managing the environment. So for example, a species like the black-footed ferret, which is highly endangered, um, has a lot of stressors on it. Uh, it's like at this tipping point. So sylvatic plague, um, which kills its prey species, prairie dogs, and can kill the ferrets as well, that's something where, where we are more actively trying to manage. So uh, the populations are so low, there are um, uh, captive populations or captive bred animals that are reintroduced into the wild um, by Smithsonian, by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and others. Uh, there is a vaccine that USGS National Wildlife Health Center developed to protect the uh, ferrets and the prairie dogs uh, from this disease. And in the case of what we're dealing with right now, the COVID-19 pandemic, that was another potential stressor when we found out through lab studies that mustelids are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2. So they created um, USGS National Wildlife Health Center, worked with Fish and Wildlife Service to create a basic vaccine. And they have vaccinated some of the captive population that would be reintroduced to protect them from COVID. So uh, there are times when these emerging novel invasive pathogens or diseases need you know, humans to intervene and help play a role for species that are small or that have a lot of stressors on them. Um, yeah, seeing all that ferret stuff from far away has been really interesting, especially when they came out with the COVID vaccines for them. Um, I was worried about them. Um, and so it was exciting to see that it was so rapidly deployed that we were able to vaccinate some of them. Um, one of the things I think about with the environment is, you know, our environment is changing. We have climate change happening. And so some diseases we're seeing more frequently, particularly the fungal diseases, um, like white nose syndrome, um, like chytrid fungus in amphibians and snake fungal disease um, in snakes, which we are seeing quite frequently right now at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. Um, and sometimes um, these diseases can resolve themselves in the species in the wild just with them hanging out and getting some UV rays and resting, um, but that can also interrupt their natural behavior. Um, and then they might be more at risk for predation or for a human to just pick them up. Um, when we get them, we are able to treat them with antifungal therapy and supportive care, and they do tend to get better, um, but it's, a stressful balance to see that we have people that call um, concerned because they're seeing the effects of this um, in and around their home. Um, and so trying to balance how to fix that, you know, if an individual animal's in my care, I can do that. But how do we help these folks that um, it's a larger thing and, you know, I can't just spread antifungals everywhere. Um, that's something that they're trying to figure out a lot, especially with the bats. So um, it's a it's a really delicate balance, I think. Dr. Camille, I think it's it's super funny that you brought up blackfoot ferrets because they're I'm I'm from northern Colorado and that part of um, Wyoming and, and northern Colorado in that area, that's a that's a big issue with with the the prairie dogs and the diseases that kind of have been ravaging them off and on. But I mean again, this is when I was 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 young and Obviously, for you, you've been in this field for a very long time, obviously, to get to the position that, that you are at now. And so I'm curious, have there been any emerging trends or trends in general that you've noticed in your time kind of studying wildlife disease? So uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jonathan Sleeman, who's the center director for USGS's National Wildlife Health Center, he has this slide, slide that he created, and it shows um, for the health center, which has been around since 1975, 
like the diseases that they were looking at back in the 70s versus the diseases that they've been looking at since the 90s, which was when I was uh, in undergrad, uh, when I was pre-vet. And it's, um, it looks like, uh, like we have more diseases in this, in this image because back in the 70s, they're really focused on waterfowl diseases, that kind of thing. And now, um, as Sarah mentioned, I mean, you've got diseases in, in herps and bats, uh, in other um, mammals and birds. And so um, in coral, you know, uh, sea stars. So uh, it, it looks like there are more diseases, you know, subjectively. Um, I suspect what has happened is since the 90s, we have just done a better job at recognizing mortality events in wildlife, investigating those. Um, we've of course got amazing tools today, uh, genetic sequencing, um, you know, that allows us to kind of quickly uh, identify diseases and not just in the terrestrial environment, but the aquatic environment as well. So fish diseases, um, as well as uh, outside of freshwater, if you look at um, some impacts that we're seeing in the marine environment, like sadly today hearing about in the captive setting, otters uh, testing positive for SARS-CoV-2, for example. So I think we are doing a better job. The wildlife um, disease, uh, wildlife management um, community at looking for these diseases. Um, but what I will say, kind of going back to my being a nerd <laughs> about disease, uh, I think we're seeing more RNA viruses um, popping up and evolving. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we're seeing more fungi uh, causing disease. So. I think something's going on there with, um, with our pathogens and environmental changes and how that is leading to disease outbreaks. And Sarah, I know you're um, in some ways kind of at the other end of the spectrum of like get, getting all this experience and figuring out what, what you're going to do when you grow up and uh, <laughs> all, of, all of the wonderful and amazing things out there. But I'm very curious to know in your time at the Wildlife Center and your year at the Wildlife Center, um, what has your experience been in terms of wildlife diseases? What have you noticed or what are the issues? Um, I didn't expect to see snake fungal disease. I, um, we haven't, I don't think quite published a report about the prevalence of what we've seen here. I think it's about 40%, but I'm not a hundred percent sure that it's 40%. Um, but it's definitely out and about and we see it and we, um, we actually take samples of all of our animals, um, or of all of our snakes, um, and submit that. Um, and I think that a lot of the disease sampling that we do, I wasn't aware that we would do so much as a hospital. I think it's really great that we are able to participate in all of that so it can sort of go up the chain um, to people who are studying these pathogens. Um, and I, I feel like uh, snake fungal disease is one that I've definitely seen. Uh, you know, we see a lot of bacterial illnesses um, from patients being predated upon. Um, and then um, I don't, there's not a lot of direct things I can say that we see on the day to day. Um, but some of that is also because we, we take samples but we don't always directly test for things because while a lot of these um, things can be sampled for, there's not always a commercial test that can be done. Um, and so that's something that's lagging behind some of the um, like, laboratory and institutional level things, um, you know, USGS can go around and, and swab and get a direct sample, but uh, we might not know at the clinical level um, exactly what we're dealing with every single time. So piggybacking off of what you were just saying there, Sarah, I'm wondering what the role of from a small wildlife hospital, small wildlife hospital like the Wildlife Center of Virginia, all the way up to the USGS and kind of everything in between, what roles are played at the different levels when it comes to disease monitoring and kind of keeping track of these emerging disease trends? Yeah, um, definitely. Good question. Um, so on my level at, you know, being a uh, general practitioner, wildlife veterinarian, uh, we're treating the individual patients for those diseases. And then we're also watching for spikes and changes. So we can act as a sentinel for different types of disease. So if all of a sudden, 
uh, over the summertime, we had a whole bunch of little pine siskins that were coming in and dying immediately. Sometimes I wouldn't even get the chance to, you know, open up the box and they would be deceased. Um, and it happened that there was a salmonella outbreak um, in those birds. Um, and when we have something like that, we report that to our state wildlife veterinarian um, and other agencies and everybody sort of becomes aware that something's going on. Um, also, one of the great things about the Wildlife Center of Virginia is that we have a huge social media presence. Um, and so we can talk with the community um, locally or even more broad sometimes um, where we can say, you know, hey, we've been seeing this, make sure everybody's cleaning their bird feeders um, and, and being sort of like community level. Um, and then we sort of feed everything up the chain. And then um, the people like Dr. Camille who are disease ecologists, they put all those pieces together and say, you know, oh, hey, the Wildlife Center is seeing this. Up in Maryland, they're seeing that. Down in Georgia, we're, we're seeing this. Let's put all that together um, and see if there's a trend, see if there's something that we need to make some modifications about. Um, so it's it all interacts for sure. And to actually take that same question for you, Camille, that I had for Sarah, um, but we're just dialing it way back to the mid 2000s. Um, so you were at the Wildlife Center of Virginia as the intern back in the day in 2005. I'm wondering if you can recall, <laughs> um, it was a while ago, dig deep, but if you can recall, were there any like hot button diseases of the time in your year with us where you were like, wow, we are seeing a lot of this and I didn't expect it. I remember from being a veterinary student at the Wildlife Center of Virginia. So I'll go back a little bit further. Okay. And Priscilla was there mm -hmm. and uh, it was a uh, West Nile virus and seeing the neurological disease in raptors. Yeah. Um, and sorry, I'm having to dig deep. <laughs> uh, well, I was hoping you would say that. Goodness. Yep. Because that's what I was thinking too, but I could not remember if I pegged my years correctly in there. Yeah. But I, I remember that of when West Nile virus hit the East Coast and us seeing like waves of raptors coming through. And it was like lots of crows, lots of corvids, um, some hawks, some owls, bigger owl species. And our little isolation room at the time just being like inundated it was like that you could see it, it just like the wave hit. Yeah, and um, just to follow up on that, that really showed, um, I think West Nile virus uh, coming to the US really showed the important linkage between um, clinical wildlife veterinarians and um, federal agencies. Uh, so what you all were seeing, so what was, being seen by wildlife rehabilitators, what was being seen uh, at zoos, uh, that really fed up to the, um, fed up, that went up to the federal government, sorry, as they were trying to understand what was going on because the, you know, there, was, there were human cases, there were you know, corvids dying and um, they knew it was um, an encephalitis associated with mosquitoes, but um, they were trying to pinpoint exactly what it was. Um, and then seeing that neurological disease, I am i can't remember exactly, but I'm just going to peg it on the Wildlife Center of Virginia. You know, I think that um, some of those early, those reports of seeing neurological disease in raptors really, I think, came from the Wildlife Center of Virginia uh, and others kind of reporting that up because I don't think that that's what people were looking for. They were thinking of, you know, just about the corvids. Um, so yeah, so that's that's really important. And I'll, I'll circle back one last thing. Uh, avian influenza, um, when it hit bird flu 2015 here in the US, um, we expected it to affect poultry. There had been some research by USGS in the lab to say that raptors could be affected, but I know it was a report up from clinical um, veterinarians up to say, we are seeing neurological raptors 
um, and then getting the confirmation that it was highly pathogenic avian influenza. And then also there was a case with Canada geese too that got neurological disease from AI. So uh, yeah, it all feeds up um, not only federal, but the agencies. So when you all work with the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries, we meet with state agencies every six months, federal agencies with the states, and all that kind of comes together to create the big picture of what's the impact, how do we deal with this? I just think that's so cool. Just purely from, from a, I don't know, a personal standpoint, I just think it's really like neat and exciting how much collaboration and then working together that there is from these different levels and how you're able to make these broad data-driven hypotheses and, and off of the little results that we get here from, you know, a single patient that comes into the wildlife center or, uh, you know, all across the country. I just think it's really neat. Um, and speaking of neat, because here at Untamed Unfiltered, we do love nerds. And I know both of you self-identify as, as disease nerds. And I think that I, all of us probably can identify as a nerd for something. And hopefully some of the viewers out there are nerdy as well. We love nerds here at Unfiltered. So before we finish off this episode, I'm wondering if the two of you would be willing to tell us and our viewers a little bit about your very favorite disease. So it's sort of like asking a wildlife veterinarian, what is your favorite patient? Such a hard question. <laughs> um, so I've, I've mentioned some diseases already today. So I think one that I'll point out that is fascinating to me because it is such a challenge, um, prion diseases. So, you know, thinking back to like basic biology and beta sheets um, as part of a protein. So to think that an abnormally folded protein is somehow infectious or contagious. And uh, in this case, the concern being the prion that causes chronic wasting disease in, in deer. Um, it has had such a negative impact um, on deer elk populations, um, not just in the US, but in other countries as well. And it's a challenge for us. So I'm interested in it, I'd say mainly because I'm like, how do we, how do we deal with this? Because not only is it not a virus or bacteria, it's you know, this weird prion, but it's also very difficult to deal with because it is highly persistent in the environment. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just say, there's some USGS science that will be coming out um, this year related to, to its um, persistence in the environment, but that just makes it such a challenge. So I guess I'm interested because it's a, you know, as a veterinarian, it's like a foe. It's like this, you know, we're trying to figure out how do we deal with this? Yeah, uh, that is a good one. I um, also have trouble determining this. I know you guys said you might ask me and I was like, oh no. A lot. <laughs> I have interest in a lot. Um, and I feel like every new disease I learn about, I'm like, oh, I, I need to know everything about it. Tell me everything. Um, and how can I help? So um, I'll give you one that I've been interested in lately, um, which is rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus two. Um, it's been spreading across the country. Um, I think it's in nine states right now, but probably that could change at any moment. Um, and it's just a really interesting disease. Um, it's been around in its um, sort of precursor uh, for decades, but then all of a sudden uh, we have this new type. And then last year, all of a sudden um, it started popping up um, and suddenly it popped up in our native bunny. So before it had just been in domestic rabbits, um, which are like European rabbits is what they come from. So um, all of the farmed rabbits and all of the like cute, adorable bunnies that everybody brings to their vet, um, those are all European rabbits. And then our Eastern cottontails, um, desert cottontails, jackrabbits, all of a sudden they were becoming positive um, and dying in massive quantities uh, from this disease, which is quite scary um, because not only is it sad for those populations, um, rabbits are a super important part of the food chain. Um, and so what will happen to everybody who needs to eat them? Um, so it also likes to hang around in the environment. Um, and so it's just a really big, uh, difficult thing to figure out how to approach it. Um, and so I feel like right now we're in the monitoring and um, sort of diagnosing stage where it's like, where is it? Um, let's make sure we 
keep um, as many populations healthy as possible. Um, you know, watch out for the little baby pygmy rabbits in Washington. I don't want them to get it. Um, and so um, it's it's just something that's really interesting um, about the dynamics of it. You know, why suddenly is it in this these new species, um, and how many new species? You know, is it going to jump into the pikas too? Like, what's going to happen? So um, it's just really fascinating learning about it um, and learning about how to be on the uh, lookout for it. Um, I'm actually getting ready to move to New Mexico, um, which is one of the states where it is. Um, and so when I am um, in practice there, it'll be something I'll have to be on the watch out for. So very fascinating. I, that was perfection, you guys. I feel like if you asked your average person, like, what's your favorite disease? They would be like, what's wrong with you? Uh, but for both of you, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know, I have too many. So <laughs> that's like basically exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, because like I said, right? Like nerd out on your best wildlife medicine topics. I love it. And honestly, I cannot think of a better way to end this episode. <laughs> so uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Camille, Dr. Sarah. Thank you for joining us. And thank you everyone out there for watching and we will see you next week. Bye everyone. Two, three.